Welcome back to the Hard Run Box News Corner. We're actually at episode 100 today, which is yeah a bit of a milestone for News Corner and the Hard Run Box channel in general. It hasn't really felt like I've made 100 of these episodes, but yeah, I guess when you think about it, it's around one a week for just under two years. So hopefully you've found these videos interesting over the years and a helpful weekly roundup for all the news in the PC space. Also, thanks to everyone who has supported the channel along the way. As you might have seen, we did recently pass 500,000 subscribers here on YouTube, which is another little milestone for us. Wouldn't be possible to do what we do and reach this many subscribers without all the support we get from you guys. So thanks onwards and upwards for hardware unboxed. Enough of that stuff though, let's get into the real news topics for this week and there's been a few interesting things to talk about. Firstly, I'm just going to touch really briefly on the rumor that AMD's Zen 3 Ryzen 4000 desktop processors will be built using TSMC's 5 nanometer plus process technology. If I don't talk about this, I'm sure many of you will be wondering why not in the comments below, so just a quick couple of sentences from me on the story. Uh, this topic did garner a reasonable amount of interest yesterday when the rumor appeared at DigiTimes, but we don't really have anything to add here. We don't know whether this rumor is true or not. We don't have any other insights at this stage. So yeah, wouldn't make for a very exciting segment if we talked about it any further. Personally, I'm quite skeptical of the claims made, but as I said, don't really know much about it and we're not a rumor channel, so we don't really enjoy talking about these sorts of stories. I would advise anyone though to take these sorts of rumors with a massive grain of salt, do some in-depth independent research, and don't just take DigiTime's word at face value. Also, I think we're starting to approach a bit of a silly season with rumors. There's lots of rubbish flying around at the moment and it's only gonna get worse when more GPU rumors are added into the mix. So yeah, be smart, don't believe everything that you read. All right, moving away from rumors and into a real news story, we have official confirmation of B550 motherboard pricing from two companies this week, Gigabyte and MSI. Normally this isn't the sort of story you'd bother covering, but the pricing has caused a bit of a stir among some people who have been surprised at the high prices being listed. So let's talk about the Gigabyte pricing first. Their cheapest boards, the B550M DS3H and the B550M Gaming, start at 94 and 99 US dollars respectively, and there's also two other lower price MATX boards in the Aura series. The first ATX board is the B550 Gaming X, which is priced at $140, then it increases to $160 for the Aorus Elite, $180 for the Aorus Pro, and a rather crazy $280 for the Aorus Master. There's also a Vision D board at $260 and an ITX board for $180. Compared to current pricing on similar model names, this is a substantial price increase. The B450 Aorus Elite, for example, was sold for $110 US dollars, and now the same board in a B550 version will cost $50 more at launch. The cheapest board, the DS3H, is up a little over $20 from its B450 price of just $72 right now. MSI as well released their price list for B550 boards as part of their live stream announcement. MSI doesn't have the same sort of entry level board as the DS3H, so their cheapest model, the B550M Pro Dash, will start at $120. More familiar models like the B550A Pro will start at $140, then $150 for the Gaming Plus, $180 for the Tomahawk, and $190 for the Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. The flagship board is the Gaming Carbon Wi-Fi at $220. Again, fairly substantial price increases here. The B450 Tomahawk Max is a $120 motherboard, so pushing up to $180 for the B550 version is a huge price increase. Even on the lower end, the B550A Pro is $40 higher than the price for the B450A Pro Max. So I've seen a few complaints about these board prices, so let's talk a little bit about what is happening here, why the boards are priced where they are, and what we can expect around the launch. Firstly, what we've seen from the last couple of motherboard generation launches is that initial board prices are high, but then filtered down a bit in the months after launch. X570 boards, for example, all launched around $200. US One example is ASUS's entry-level board, the Tough Gaming X570 Plus, which launched at $190. Four months later, the board was available for $165 and has remained there. In fact, there are now plenty of X570 models around that $160 price point. We expect something similar to happen with B550, high launch prices for a few months, and then by the holiday season, things will drop down. 
We also asked several board partners about their B550 motherboard pricing and the reason for the higher prices this generation. Some of the reasons we received back included an increase in logistics costs due to human malware. So this would be, for example, an increase in shipping cost for sending boards out to retailers, a cost that isn't required for existing B450 inventory. Other reasons include price volatility being factored into the unit price, cost of manufacturing for these boards being higher than with previous generations, and also market positioning. One partner told us that they see their higher end boards as offering premium features with a substantial upgrade in functionality over B450, so those boards are being priced as such. Part of this seems to be the thinking that, well, these boards, they do include PCIe 4.0, and on something like an Aorus Elite, you are getting a 12-phase VRM design. Many older B450 boards, including the B450 Aorus Elite, were only four-phase designs. For many customers, this new feature set of B550 will be sufficient as you know a decent enthusiast board, so why would you bother going X570 unless you really needed that additional PCIe 4.0 functionality? So there are a number of reasons here for the price increase, and honestly, many of the B550 boards do look significantly better than their B450 counterparts. I think this represents a big shift in the marketing position of the B550 range. This isn't just an entry-level chipset anymore. These motherboards are fully capable of servicing mid-range and even high-end builds. Yeah, there will be some cheap and crappy options, but these new B550 ranges appear to be targeting yeah, a wider market segment, and board partners are realizing that for many customers, X570 will only be a flagship high-end choice, so it makes sense to have, yeah, board prices in that $150 to $200 range being B550 motherboards. We'll see how pricing ends up playing out around the launch, but yeah, this doesn't seem quite as bad as it might on first glance. News, rumors, and leaks are continuing to filter out surrounding AMD's upcoming Zen 2 refresh, aka the Matisse refresh. This all started up maybe a week or two ago when the first leaks began for three upcoming AMD processors, the Ryzen 9 3900 XT, the Ryzen 7 3800 XT, and the Ryzen 5 3600 XT. Various leaks have trickled out since then, pointing to an announcement in the middle of June, ahead of a launch date of July 7th. The thinking here is that these CPUs will be anniversary editions, released one year after the first Zen 2 processors, and a bit of a stopgap before Ryzen 4000 desktop parts arrive using Zen 3, and that could be yeah, a fair bit later. At this stage, nothing is confirmed. However, current leaks suggest each of these models feature the same core count as their non-XT variant, which yeah makes perfect sense. You'd expect the 3900XT to be a 12-core part like the 3900X. The improvement comes mostly in clock speeds. We've seen various leaks and rumors showing different clocks, not sure which leak is accurate at this stage, but we've seen some posts suggesting boost clocks up to 4.8 GHz, and others like this latest 3 d Mark benchmark leak showing up to 4.7 GHz. The leaks also indicate boost clocks will be raised by 200 MHz or so, with the potential for higher FCLKs too. Again, none of these things are confirmed at this point, but at this point it does seem likely the CPUs will feature some sort of clock speed increase to justify the XT name. Most of the specification discussion at this stage is just for pure interest sake because what really matters is the combination of performance and pricing. If these XT processors are significantly more expensive than the current discounted prices of Ryzen 3000 CPUs, they probably won't be worth buying. As for why AMD would introduce a refreshed lineup like this, we talked a bit about that in our Q&A video from a few days ago, so yeah, go back and check that out for our thoughts. Intel has updated the box cooler they are shipping out with select 10th gen processors. The new cooler has been spotted by reviewers in China and Vietnam, and is quite an obvious visual change with a black heatsink instead of Intel's signature grey design that they've been using for box coolers for ages now, and there also appears to be a copper slug on the base. Intel told Tom's Hardware that this box cooler is only found with a select number of processors, the Core i9-10900 and 10900F, as well as the Core i7-10700 and 10700F. These are Intel's locked processors with a 65W TDP. In addition, the cooler comes with three Xeon W1200 workstation CPUs, which all have an 80W TDP. This makes sense given we didn't get this new black cooler with the Core i5-10400 and the Core i3-10100 CPUs that we bought at retail. So why the change? 
Well, this new cooler has an increased TDP rating of 80 watts, allowing it to be included with the Xeon W1200 CPUs, which also feature an 80 watt TDP. Older box coolers featured just a 65 watt TDP to exactly match Intel's main TDP rating for desktop processors. I guess Intel figured they could also throw in this cooler with some of their higher end lock CPUs to eke out a small amount of extra performance when running above their TDPs. More benchmarks for upcoming AMD Ryzen processors have allegedly leaked, this time for the upcoming Zen 2 based Renoir APU series which will be branded as Ryzen 4000. The leaked benchmarks are, once again, from 3 d Mark and show Ryzen Pro APUs, the 4700G being an 8 core model, the 4400G being 6 core and the 4200G being 4 core. There's not much to say on this leak given we know pretty much exactly what Renoir will look like on the desktop given we know what it looks like on mobile already. The die has 8 Zen 2 CPU cores, 8 megabytes of level 3 cache, and 8 Vega compute units. So each Ryzen 4000 APU will use some combination of those hardware features. The lower end models such as the 4200G are expected to feature 6 GPU compute units along with 4 cores, and all processors only support PCIe 3.0. The only remaining question concerns clock speeds, but again, for mobile parts, we know that boost clocks will be in the mid to low 4 GHz range, while base clocks should be at least in the mid 3 GHz range. GPU clocks are expected to reach over 2 GHz at the top end. Performance should be much higher than existing Zen Plus APUs due to all the benefits of AMD's Zen 2 architecture, along with an increase in CPU cores from 4 to 8. However, GPU gains may only be modest due to a redesign there that sees higher clock speeds on fewer compute units. 8 down from 11. For gaming with a discrete GPU, its likely performance will be limited compared to non-APU Ryzen processors as the cache size is a lot lower, just 8 megabytes instead of 32 meg for the Ryzen 5 3600 as an example. Shouldn't be too far away until these chips land and we can put them through a series of benchmarks. Couple of quicker topics to round this one out. First topic, yeah, it's a simple one. MSI has confirmed that their non-Max B450 and X470 motherboards will support Zen 3 processors. This was confirmed as part of their B550 announcement livestream. The Max series motherboards with the larger 32 megabyte BIOS ROM will support Zen 3 with the full feature set of these boards and potentially with the larger array of supported CPUs. Meanwhile, the non-Max series, which uses a 16 megabyte ROM, will also support Zen 3, but with a limited BIOS with a cut-down interface and support for some CPUs being removed. Some owners of the non-Max boards were concerned that the 16 megabyte BIOS would mean that MSI won't bother with Zen 3 support, but the company has now confirmed that 16 megabyte boards will still get support. So yeah, that's nice. Final topic for this week is a monitor announcement from Acer, the Nitro XV272UX, which is yeah not a great name given there are already a few XV272U monitors on the market. Anyway, that X on the end means that this display is a 2560 by 1440 IPS panel with a 240Hz refresh rate. And given its August launch date, could be the very first monitor with those specs to hit the market. There's been a lot of interest lately surrounding EVE's Spectrum monitors, which were announced a while back with one variant as a 1440p 240Hz IPS. However, it seems Acer will beat them to the punch with the XV272UX. AHVA panel from AU Optronics here, one millisecond grade gray response time apparently, along with the usual adaptive sync features. Hopefully we'll be able to review this when it lands. That's it for this week's News Corner. I'm gonna wrap this one up. Pretty quickly, I reckon. As always, you can subscribe to get this segment in your inbox every week. Consider supporting us on Patreon. We've got links to that in the description below if you want to sign up, get access to our Discord chat, monthly live streams, behind the scenes videos. I think Steve's got a shed update up there right now for Patreon members. And yeah, that's it. Catch you in the next one. <laughs>